Hey guys, it's Danny. Alrighty, today I'm going to talk about the things that probably you'll never see me use with our kids. You probably never saw me use these things with our kids, maybe with the exception of one. Uh, things like pesticides, insecticides and other things which I will talk about today. Uh, but I don't know if you've ever wondered what my reasoning is. I always have a reason for something. And just like you guys, I have certain fears of certain stuff. However, I like to think I do have some reasons why I don't use pesticides, insecticides and stuff of the sort, which I would like to share with you. Before we even start this though, I would just like to mention that these are very personal things and I've never said it's wrong to use insecticides or it's wrong to use pesticides and stuff. I always said I'm not a fan of that, I don't feel comfortable with that. If you feel comfortable with something, that's perfectly fine. I'm not the type to say this is bad. And I think this is a good mindset to have, even if you don't like, let's say, fertilizers, which is something some of you don't like, that's fine. Nobody says you should use them. You'll discover in time the effects of that, if there are any, but you should never ever try to impose your personal feeling to other people. You know what I'm saying? So I will give it that all of these things that I'm going to mention are just my own thing. Does not mean you should not use them. They all have a purpose and maybe a place, but at the same time, it is really important to have reasons for something. Having unreasonable fears, not the greatest situation. So let's just keep that in mind. I'm not saying all of these things are bad and nobody should ever use them. I'm just saying I have personal issues with them. That's one thing. And second, it is absolutely fine if you don't want to use something because you're afraid of some repercussions, let's say. Whether they're justified or not, we need to understand that this is a hobby. They're plants. They're absolutely under no circumstance worth endangering your health or anybody else's for them. They're just plants. End of story. Please do not endanger your health for these plants. We all love them, we all care for them, but there is a line we must not cross because it's, it's just not gonna end well for us. So the most important thing is that you feel comfortable in the hobby with what you do, with what you use and so on and so forth, just so you sleep good at night and you actually get to enjoy the hobby, not enjoy the orchid, but feel afraid every time you do something. You know what I'm saying? At the same time, we need to understand that some of these fears might not be justified or might just be something that we have in our minds. So never under any circumstance, again, not a good idea to impose our fears onto others. However, absolutely okay to explain them and I'm here to explain my personal fears because just like you, I'm human, I have my personal fears, whether they're funded or not, but I do have reasons for them. So, because this week somebody asked me about a certain product, I shall start with that. So this week in the community section, I showed you a picture with a grasshopper just chilling next to my Vanda, which is very, very nerve wracking because in my area, we do get very big grasshoppers. This was a medium sized one that can completely devour a plant within a day. So seeing a grasshopper, not the best things you can see next to a Vanda orchid. And my way of dealing with grasshoppers is to just get the hose and shoo them away pretty much. They're kind of cute. I feel kind of sorry to do anything to them. I just don't want them here. That's all I want. So I shoo them away, usually in my neighbor's garden, just to get some revenge on that noise. Anyway, I digress. So somebody asked me if I ever used datamaceous earth and it's supposed to be non-toxic and actually keep pests away. And I answered to that, no, I probably will never use it because it kind of gives me the heebie-jeebies. So first let's understand what it is. Datamaceous earth is made from the fossilized remains of tiny aquatic organisms called diatoms. And probably amongst other things, they are used to combat pests. How do they do that? Well, apparently they have very sharp edges that really damages the insect's body. And it does work on a whole range of pests because it acts mechanically. And yes, being that it's just a bunch of diatom skeletons, it's not toxic. However, though, the thing that gives me the heebie-jeebies is this whole situation with the sharp edges that manages to actually cut the insect's body. Now, hold up a second. If an insect can be killed by this dust, if I happen to inhale it, what's gonna happen to my lungs? Sure, it's just so fine and tiny that probably will not cut into my skin or anything. I'm not thinking of anything of the sorts, but I can see how it can irritate my breathing mechanism, my lungs. If you think about it, even dust can irritate you and dust is not sharp, does not kill any bug. 
and it still irritates you if you inhale it. What would happen if by mistake we inhaled that tomaceous earth? So let's say you use it outside and that's fine. But what if there's a wind one day and you just happen to be outside and it hits you in the face? I'm not even talking about inside use. If that thing is capable of splicing into a pest, what would it do to your lungs? Now, I don't know the answer to that. And of course, on the internet, when you search things, you'll always find something rather dramatic, something that says, no, it's perfectly harmless. But my logic and interior thought process says, hey, you know what? Maybe you really shouldn't inhale it. And it's not only me we're talking about here, we're talking about the other people as well, because I don't live in this secluded laboratory. I have guests, I might have children. What if for some people, it is actually very, very irritant. Do I want to put everybody through this? Absolutely not. So the mere thought of having sharp edged dust all around my plants absolutely gives me the heebie-jeebies. So for a thing to be non-toxic doesn't really warm my heart too much if its mechanism is physical rather than chemical. For something to be toxic, you need to have a chemical reaction. This doesn't have a chemical reaction with anything as far as I know, but it does have a physical reaction and I do not doubt it is very efficient in removing pests. I don't think it's very good for the lungs. So I'm thinking the application of that tomaceous earth can be controlled in areas which can be flushed afterwards at least, I don't know. But that would have to be the most recent product that I personally do not have the guts to use simply because something really doesn't click when I hear sharp edged dust. Mmm, how appealing. So what do you guys think? Do you have experience with it? Let us know down below your experience um, because I would absolutely love to learn more. Even though I have this fear of it, I do want to learn more about it. The second thing you will not see me use on my channel probably ever from now on is toxic pesticide. Now, when I say toxic, I mean toxic. Stuff you need to wear gloves with, stuff you should not inhale, you should always do in ventilated rooms and so on. And these things are typically regulated, but there are pesticides we can actually find at the flower shop or garden center, which are seriously poisoning to the environment and not only to us as well. I did use them once because I was at a loss with spider mites, you might already know, and the trouble, the absolutely horrific experience that I had with it just sealed the deal for me. I didn't like them from the beginning, but now I'm just completely horrified by them because I have this really bad experience. It involved my boyfriend who tried to help me. I had to spray my entire collection. It was windy, vapors were traveling everywhere. We had masks. It was just such a mess that I, I never wanna go through. However, pesticides do have their role and I do believe there is a way to use them a safe way and I don't have anything against them really. I just don't want them in my house or my grow space or my terrace or anywhere because they truly, truly are toxic and you need to handle them with the utmost safety. Remember what I was telling you? These are just plants. We should never endanger our health. If you don't feel comfortable or if you don't think you can protect yourself properly against the effects of the pesticides, why use them? That's at least my mentality on them. I don't like them because I don't believe I can protect myself from them enough and just have this irrational fear of toxic things. I don't know why. And since we're here, I do want to address something really, really fast. On my video in which I talk about my non-toxic recipe against spider mites, there was an outraged viewer who said, how can I say it's non-toxic because dish soap is very toxic for us? Well, I can do this with dish soap and nothing bad would happen to me. I cannot do this with pesticides because they will create a rash, if not more than that. Sure, everything has a degree of toxicity. Soap is just so, so, so incredibly low. We use it all our lives on our hands and our bodies and it's okay. And I'm not talking here about people with certain sensitivities. That's a whole different story. There is, however, a difference between being non-toxic and being non-edible. Yes, you should not eat soap. That would be bad for you, but it's not toxic because I can do this and nothing bad will happen to me. I consider the recipe that I gave you to be non-toxic. Should you eat it or drink it? Absolutely not. Should you like inhale it? No, but those are common sense things. And as I was saying, there's a difference between non-edible and non-toxic. Many things that are not toxic are actually non-edible. So I just wanted to clear up the air about that. I'm gonna go wash my hands.
Another very valid concern about using pesticides, at least for me, is creating immunity or resistance of certain pests to that substance. And I've actually met a person here who specialized in pest resistance and how we can minimize it. If we overuse a substance, pests which are very adaptable, they're the most adaptable creatures on earth. So as I was saying, if we overuse substances, we can create resistance within our population. And I'm personally very aware of that because there aren't many substances available for free purchase on the market. There are things that you need permits for. And there's a good reason for that. So you can imagine that everybody uses the substances on the market, right? So the pests already kind of have a resistance to that. I've experienced it firsthand with the spider mites. I did not eradicate my infestation just using abamectin because everybody uses it. And I believe that some of the population I had, whoa, that was a heavy accent, the population that I have or had was already resistant to it. Therefore, I just propagated a little bit more of this resistance. And I just don't wanna be responsible for propagating that resistance because yes, pesticides do have their role. Imagine if one day we're invaded by something and it affects agriculture on a global level. We need to have at least the pesticides to keep that invasion in check. And I know this sounds like a sci-fi scenario, maybe certain areas of, of the globe could be affected. If we don't have the pesticide to work, toxicity will be the least of our worries. So I don't know, maybe I'm overdoing it here, but that's my thought process. I don't want to contribute to that. I'm sure people have these substances in check. I just don't want to contribute. That's all I'm saying. And I will mention that there is a high chance I'm overreacting with this, but that's just my reasoning on things. Next up, Fungicides, very, very similar case with pesticides. They are very toxic and whenever we work with them, we need to make sure that we have protective gear, that we don't use our bare hands, that we don't spray in closed rooms and so on and so forth. Pretty much every fungicide or pesticide product will have on the back all the instructions and all the warnings pretty much in red, in bold. They will really warn you to be careful with these substances. And of course, again, my fear of toxic stuff and spreading vapors in the air kicks in. I don't want to go through that. However, with the fungicides, not only can we create resistance of certain pathogens, but I believe it's even harder to determine what type of fungicide we should use for what. Because unlike pests, when we have a fungal issue, it's hard to pinpoint what it is. And I'll just give you an example for the funsies. Yesterday, we talked about my Calia orchid being affected by what I think is a fungal disease. All of the pseudobulbs rotted, we had to intervene. If you take a look at the comment section, you will see a few people suggested it's this fungus or that fungus or the other. So which one is it? Because everybody seems to be very sure of what the problem is. Is it Fusarium? Is it the other one? The truth may be that it is actually one of them or none of them or all of them at once. For me, it is just so hard to pinpoint what exactly pathogen created what because we don't even see it. We do see some symptoms, but all of these symptoms are just so similar to one another. There are only a few things that we can say for certain, yes, this is Fusarium, or yes, this is black rot. But again, with the black rot, there are a few things that can cause it, not just one. So what substance do we use? Well, we can use a broad spectrum thing, but usually broad spectrum stuff, maybe they're not so efficient as a specialized substance. So in the end, we are going to treat our orchid with everything that we think will work. Sometimes it will work, sometimes it will not. But in the end, there is a high chance we incorrectly place diagnosis. And sometimes we might make treatments in vain because we just happen to have a different pathogen. I believe that with microscopic things, you actually need a microscope to see the shape of the pathogen to really determine what it is. And you might have noticed, I never in my videos go into the detail of what pathogen causes what rot because I am not sure I don't have a microscope I'm not even a biologist or a scientist so saying oh yes judging by the pictures this is uh, this fungus uh, pathogen no because I'm pretty sure I will be wrong so I don't want to perpetuate something wrong therefore in my videos I limit myself to saying fungal infection uh, bacterial infection that's just something that applies to me I don't feel comfortable of saying something if I'm not at least kind of sure it is. With Fusarium, it's a different story because we do have that visual sign, the purple ring, at least that's what the article suggests and it's pretty obvious. But when you have a rotting pseudobulb, 
Can you guess which pathogen created the rot? I'm not sure. And as you can see in my comment section, everybody thinks it's a different thing. What is the truth? I don't know. Do you guys know? So with the fungicides, that's the whole reasoning for everything. It's not something I would do, but again, nothing wrong with using fungicides. Maybe in some applications, the life of entire crops or entire species depends on it. I just don't believe I am that person to make a difference in the world. You know what I'm saying? So fungicides, really not for me. And lastly, leaf shiners. And here I will include store-bought leaf shiners and homemade leaf shiners. You'll see what I mean. So a leaf shine is something that, like the name suggests, makes the leaves shiny. I don't use leaf shiner. What you see here is just natural shine. This is a Phalaenopsis. These are new leaves. They're naturally shiny. I didn't do anything to them. Now to make the leaf shine, usually these products contain some sort of oil. Now, orchids are rather sensitive to oils, and I'll just share with you a video that I made about a year ago testing vegetable oil versus mineral oil. You might already know that I'm using oil for spider mites, but the dosage is really, really low. I'm using between 1% and 2% concentration, which is extremely low, and no, it does not make the leaves shine. It does produce a little film on the leaf, but not enough to make it pop, make it shine like the leaf shiners do. So because I do have that experience of actually totally destroying the leaf of my psilogeny with oil, which was intended for spider mites, um, I don't wanna play around with leaf shine. We all love a shiny leaf, but some orchids simply don't have shiny leaves as a natural texture. Some of them are even glow cuts. They have this sort of dust on them. So putting leaf shine on them really not the best of ideas. They're not designed to work like that. And with leaf shiners, although I never use them, I kind of saw them in action. I just think they have such a tremendous amount of oil or a different substance that creates a layer on the leaf that I just believe we're just very prone to suffocating the leaves if we use it. Again, maybe I'm wrong with this one. I just happen to have this really bad experience with oils in general, and I would not play with oils on leaves. A Phalaenopsis might have a stronger leaf than a Selogeny. Maybe the Selogeny is indeed very, very sensitive when it comes to these things, but do you know by heart the orchids which will be sensitive to oils? No. Do you want to take the risk? I personally don't. Therefore, leaf shiners, no. There is a way to actually maintain the leaves clean, and this is with just water. If we have salt buildup, even with a mild acid, such as lemon juice. As a DIY leaf shine, people like to use mayonnaise. Now, did you guys ever make mayonnaise? If not, I'll tell you how you do it. You need an egg yolk, a little bit of mustard, and a heck ton of oil. And you mix them all together slowly but surely until, poof, you have mayonnaise. Mayonnaise is full of oil. That's why it has so many calories. So again, putting mayonnaise on the leaves, no, 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 no. It's like putting oil or grease on a loaf of bread. And I wanted to touch base with the mayonnaise thing because on that particular video, I do get comments like, oh, you can also use mayonnaise. No, I would never use mayonnaise on the leaves of my orchids. Sure, maybe the Phalaenopsis will be okay with the mayonnaise, maybe only on the upper side. Certainly not on the underside where the stomatas are, but the Selogeny, will she be okay with that abundant quantity of oil? I don't think so, so I don't want to try it. So to wrap it all up with the leaf shiners, I don't use them. Yes, some orchids naturally have shiny leaves, but I didn't do it. It's natural. The more you care for an orchid, the better it will look. And I just noticed I was not in frame with this orchid. There we go. So the healthier an orchid is, the shinier the leaves will be, the glossier, the bigger, the prettier it will look. So that's my motto on things, maintain orchids healthy. And when it comes to leaf shines, I really prefer to be reserved. Once again, if there are leaf shines on the market which don't contain oil and which guaranteed do not damage anything, I don't know, there might be. Let me know down below if you know any of these. I personally don't like to use them and I also think that many of them on the market are very detrimental. Equally detrimental is mayonnaise. Be very careful with that stuff. It's full of oil. It's mainly 80% oil, pretty much mayonnaise. That's what it is. And as a side note, I love mayonnaise and I make the best mayonnaise ever. It's not a good idea to eat it too often. It's very, very heavy. And with that said, thank you guys so much for watching this video. I hope you've enjoyed it. And you know what? Let me know down below what are your fears? What 
you don't do with your orchids because you're afraid. Even fertilizer, which is a bad one to have because we kind of do depend on fertilizer in a way or another if we're growing in our living room, but I can totally understand the fear of fertilizer. That's okay. Let me know your thoughts. I just want to hear from you. And with that said, thank you for watching. You know the drill, like or dislike this video below. Subscribe to my channel if you like to see other orchid videos from me, tutorials, Q and A's and other fun stuff. And if you like YouTube to notify you whenever I upload a new video, just turn on notifications for my channel. And if you're curious about my setup and all the products that I use with my orchids, check the description. Once again, I have everything listed there. And with that said, I'll see you guys next time. Bye!